Open your Bibles now, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter number 5. We have but one text, verse number 13. And my message for today, for our God and country service, for our God and country rally, is what would Jesus have us do for America? President John F. Kennedy, in his administration, spoke some words that I'm sure that none of you are a stranger to. Uh, They've become renowned. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Our first text, which we aren't going to turn there and read, is Psalms 33 and 12. And it simply says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. In Matthew 5 and verse number 13, the Lord Jesus uh, spoke these words. He said, ye, and of course he's talking to God's people, ye are the salts of the earth, but... If the salt have lost his salver, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the great blessings of of being born in this nation and for the great blessings uh, of the principles and precepts and the great history behind our nation. Thank you, Lord, that uh, Lady Liberty is still the loveliest of all and that this is the place multitudes from all over the world strive to come. Father, thank you for our nation. Lord, may you stir in our hearts a patriotic spirit. And Lord, may you stir a little bit of righteous anger as we behold uh, the unpatriotic attitude of so many in America today, even in churches Oh, God, help us. We need your help. Thank you for each person that's here today and each one uh, worshiping with us online. God, speak definitely to our hearts and help our hearts to yield in obedience to you and the call of your Holy Spirit upon our lives, whatever that might be, some for salvation. I'm sure God help people to come to Christ. And uh, Lord, help people to commit themselves uh, to Christian service and, of course, to a patriotic spirit uh, in America. Help me to preach. I'm unworthy uh, before you and before this great people and the text like the one that lies before me in Jesus' name. I pray. Our purpose in having this God and country rally today and, of course, each year is twofold. First of all is to remind us of our heritage. We, we have an honorable heritage, a great 
And then it's to remind us of our responsibilities as Americans and as Christian Americans. Just over 400 years ago, our forefathers came to our shores in search of freedom. Freedom to worship God. And uh, freedom to pursue their dreams without restraint. Our forefathers sought God's guidance. And through their many struggles in establishing our great nation, they turned to God for help. On July the 2nd, 1776, the Continental Congress voted in favor of independence from Britain. And two days later, on the 4th, Delegates from the 13 colonies adopted the Declaration of Independence, an historic document drafted by Thomas Jefferson. Among the great statements in that document, God is acknowledged Several times, and I might say to the disdain of those that would rewrite American history and those that would try to remove God from our past and the importance of Christianity from our past, we read in that document, Words and statements like this, the laws of nature and of nature's God. We read words like this, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. We read words like this appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. And we read words like this, reliance upon the protection of divine providence. The document contains a list of 27 grievances against King George III and the British government, which, of course, led to the necessity of the Declaration of Independence. And the document concludes with this statement. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred Honor. History tells us of the price those signers of the declarations paid. Here's my guiding thoughts for the message today. First of all, I, I want to remind us, I think that the Lord uh, wants us to be reminded that America is worth preserving. America is worth preserving. Secondly, I think the Lord would have us understand that God's Word must be 
uh, proclaimed and applied. Uh, listen, that's what Jesus would have us do for America. Just proclaim His Word and apply His Word to our lives in every area. And lastly, God's will must be personally accepted. But America, have you thought about this? I know that as Johnny Cash brought to our attention, you know America, the old flag, it has its problems. But be it riddled with problems, it's still worth preserving. I'm sure that we're all aware of this historic fact. Salt is a preservative. Did you know this? It's known that all human life, every one of this in this auditorium and and in every auditorium of America and among everybody that's not in our auditoriums, all human life on earth and all animal life on earth depends on its chemical properties to survive. That, my friend, is how important Important, how essential the, the subject uh, and substance of salt is. All life is dependent on it. Uh, you discover that it's essential for nerve and muscle function, for proper regulation of body fluids and blood pressure. Now, with that in mind, please notice the text. And doesn't the text take on all the more importance? The text said, Jesus said, Ye, the people of God, the the church of, of God, ye are the salt of the earth. Uh, you see... God must think the world is worth preserving. Uh, You know he does. He thinks it's worth saving. John 3.16, that tremendous verse about every child connected with any Sunday school has committed to memory. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God thinks the world is worth it. And, and, and listen, here's what God is showing us. He thinks it's so worth serving that He sends us into it as the one life essential uh, preserving influence. And I want you to understand that tells you and I that America is, is worth preserving. Let me give you some information you have heard and I don't know if you've learned this in school anymore or not. But our forefathers thought America was worth coming to. We ought to think America and all our, the America we grew up in is, is worth preserving. Uh, Our forefathers thought America was worth, worth coming to. And they were willing 
to face whatever hardships and dangers might befall them in coming to it. Uh, You know, I was thinking, you and I thought the service to say our God and country rather was worth coming to. And we're so blessed. We got up in our nice air-conditioned homes. And we bathed uh, in bathing uh, facilities that that, uh, generations before us knew nothing uh, about. And we we put on nice clothing uh, uh, from our wardrobe. And we we got in uh, uh, fairly nice automobiles that are also uh, air conditioning. And then we uh, drove those automobiles over nice roads. Aren't you glad? Had they paved the road in front of our church. And we came to church in all of our wonderful conveniences. I have a question. If we did not have those conveniences, would we think the service is still worth coming to? But our forefathers had no such conveniences. They they had nothing but trial and hardship facing them in their uh, at least four-month-long journey uh, to uh, what will be known as America. Uh, The early settlers that came to Jamestown, Virginia in 1603 faced indescribable dangers and hardships and disease plus angry Indians. These uh, elements so ravaged uh, those dear people that only 38 of the original 104 colonists survived the first year. Of the 10,000 people who left England for Jamestown in its first 15 years, only 20% were still alive and still in Jamestown in 1622. In 1620, the Mayflower voyagers arrived in Plymouth Bay, Massachusetts during a very harsh winter. They came seeking religious freedom and a fresh start in a new land. You know, I found it interesting that as many as 30 million people today can trace their ancestry uh, to those 102 pilgrims that came to America. But after 170 years of struggle, on July the 4th, 1776, 13 American colonies, after listing 27 grievances against King George III and British government, expressed their dependence on God and declared their independence from Britain. And the Revolutionary War was underway. Listen, let us be reminded. Our forefathers thought that America was worth whatever it cost in life and in death. I've provided you a look at the losses incurred and the price the signers paid for that declaration of independence from Britain. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planer and trader, saw his ships swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts. 
and he died in rags. Thomas McKim was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in Congress without pay. I wish those rascals in Congress appreciated the early congressmen and their love and willingness to serve America instead of self. And his family was kept in hiding. Listen, his possessions were taken from him, and poverty was his reward. Vandals and soldiers looted the properties of Dillery Hall, Clymer, Walton, Gwinnett, Hayward, Rutledge, Middleton. At the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson, Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. He quietly urged General George Washington to open fire. The home, his home, was destroyed, and Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis had his home and properties destroyed. The enemy jailed his wife, and she died within a few months. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. I can't help but cry this morning. I hope you don't mind. I I cannot for the life of me see how multitudes can be unmoved at the great sacrifice so many have paid for the liberties and freedoms that we enjoy this 245th birthday of America. His, his fields and gristmill were laid waste. <clears throat> for more than a year, he lived in the forest and in the caves. Returning home to find his wife dead and his children vanquished. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion and a broken heart. Norris and Livingston suffered similar effects. Such are the stories and sacrifices of the American Revolution. Thank God. For those that gave us America. Then think of all the wars since the revolution. The war of 1812, the Indian War, the Mexican War, the uh, Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, the Global War on Terror. And all the lives sacrificed. And all the lives broken. Because they loved. They loved our, our nation. You know, I, uh, always think of the young men each time I see the picture, it breaks my heart of the Normandy landings on D-Day, Tuesday, June 6, 1944, the largest seaborne uh, invasion in history. It began the liberation of France and later Europe and laid the foundation for an Allied victory at the Western Front. 10,000, 
400 uh, died Americans just in a short time. I understand a total of 10,000 casualties. Allied troops, listen. I, I can't help but weep every time I see the picture of the boats and, and the, the gate of the boat dropping down. And young men, 18 and some of them 17, and maybe even some of them younger, because in those days, uh, uh, young men were, were known to, to, to get into the service of their country as quickly as possible. And to see them disembark that boat going to the shore. Almost certain death. One, 18 and 19, and young man after another got off the boat to their death. Oh, listen. I don't have much patience for this unpatriotic attitude. I see it. Uh, in America today, and I even see it in the ranks of those so-called preachers. I really do. Oh, listen. Tell the men and the women that gave their lives, didn't even get to live long, that died and went out into eternity. Tell them why you you have that stinky, unpatriotic attitude. Listen, let me tell you something. I wouldn't walk across the street to listen to one of these worthless preachers that had an unpatriotic attitude toward our great nation. Now you know how I feel about it. (laughs) Listen, here's my point. Multitudes have thought America worth founding, worth fashioning, and worth fighting and dying for. And their needs... To be, there desperately needs to be a revival of, of patriotism in our nation. From our sanctuaries to our Sunday schools, uh, li- listen, uh, to our public schools, to every uh, segment of society that desperately needs a, to be a revival of patriotism. Just old-fashioned, I love America, patriotism. You know, we have uh, such a, 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 a unpatriotic, idiotic... Uh, attitude today that I posted on social media that there desperately needed to be a revival of patriotism in America from our sanctuaries to our schools. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'm kind of like Faye's mom. Bless her heart. Uh, We go back to a day when uh, the phones weren't all that uh, uh, so available. And uh, Faye and her mom used to correspond by letter, long written uh, letter all the time. Does anybody still remembers that form of, of correspondence? Hey, a couple of you do. But anyway, I always got so tickled at Virgie. She just spelled somehow however it sounded. <laughs> But you could always tell what mom was talking about. Anyway, I misspelled the word desperately. I put an e, a A instead of an E. And some uh, unpatriotic, idiotic 
uh, person so despised my my call for a, a revival of patriotism that that simple statement was attacked and then I was attacked because I didn't spell it right. Aren't we filled up with worthless people in America and sissies to boot? I'll tell you, we've got more panty waste men today in America than we've ever had. Faye was showing me some information and I'll tell you what, if one of you guys come in here like that, uh, you'll be the first one I ask to leave church. I ain't never asked anybody to leave church. But now, you know what guys have started doing? They started wearing lace, short breeches. Lace. Lace. Now, I got a notion what kind of fellow to wear lace. Short British. But my God, don't disgrace the house of God. Don't disgrace America with such sissiness. My, how we need a revival in America. Let me ask you something. What's America worth to you? Huh? Huh? What is America worth to you? Uh, God's Word must be proclaimed and applied. I won't be as long as what you think I am. There will be time for fireworks. I'll let you out at 9.30 tonight. No. <laughs> Notice the text. Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. And ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It's good for nothing then, except to be trampled. Here's what we learn. Uh, listen to this. If Christianity ever ceased in America, the America as we have known it and know it will cease to exist. It will, my friend. We must propagate Christianity in America. We we must. And the world over also, as far as that goes. Uh, How important is the Word of God to us? Uh, What did God's Word uh, uh, do for us? In America, what does God's Word have to do with America? Let me give you some presidential quotes you'll find interesting. President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, now, this is President Woodrow Wilson made this statement. And, uh, of course, the, the liberals and, and the good-for-nothings and the history rewriters and revisionists today, of course, they don't want nothing to do with this. They don't want nothing to do with with this. But President Woodrow Wilson said America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelation of Holy Scripture. How often do you hear a president Talk like that about America and the Bible. President James Madison said, The future and success of America is not in the Constitution, but in the laws of God. Are you ready for this? Upon which the Constitution is founded. Now, all those anti-constitutionalists, or it don't matter what the Constitution says, or let's change the Constitution to suit ourselves, the same spirit that pervades in that crowd is the same spirit that denies the authority of the Word of God. The same. President Andrew Jackson said, That book, sir is the rock upon which our republic rests. 
President Abraham Lincoln said in regard to this great book, the Bible, I have but to say it is the best gift God has given to man. All the good the Savior gave to the world was communicated through this book. Listen, I'm thankful for America and the Word of God that we came, our forefathers came uh, in obedience to. Let me give you some quick statistics. The United States has the largest Christian population in the world. The United States has an estimated 380,000 churches. August 2020 in, in the United States. The United States still sends the largest total number of missionaries. Listen, I've given you that to tell you this. America is still worth preserving. God's Word must be proclaimed. But there's sad news. Only 37% of Americans say they attend church weekly or near weekly. And it's reported that 3,400 churches close each year in America. Up to half of those are unsuccessful new churches. Friend, we must announce the Word of God. And we must give the proclamation of God's Word to our people in any subject uh, of interest that arises. We must say, this is what God says about it. This is what God says about it. But, 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 but. So many just become one big but. We must declare what God's Word says about any given subject that arises in America. Lastly, God's will must be personally accepted. Jump down, if you would, please, to uh, verse number 16. Let your light, let your light so shine before men. Don't Sunday school love kids when they, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. This little light of mine. 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 I've got a personal uh, stake in, in this thing. Uh, the God's will must be personally uh, accepted in our lives. Uh, what would God have you as an individual person do? Let me tell you quickly in just two moments or three. God would have you be saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, you can't face death with the assurance that heaven is your home. You can get on this altar and from an honest and sincere heart say, God, I know I'm lost. I'm undone. I, I can't please you within myself. I, I'm trusting in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that He shed for me on Calvary. That's what God would have you do, man, woman, boy, or girl. The uncertainty in your soul, God would have you settle the matter once for all. Gentlemen, God would have you become the spiritual heads of your home. 
and be it spouse or children, pressure to do less than put God first should be resisted with every fiber of your being. Joshua of old said, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Let me tell you what's never happened in the Rains home. My kids have never asked me what we are going to be doing on Sunday. They've never asked. Dad, where are we going this weekend? And my grandkids haven't either. Personally, God would have you make that. Wives, God would have you personally decide to stand with your husband as he stands for God. And if you've got a man that will serve the Lord, you better get under his arm and stand fast and serve with him. But ladies, we know that's not all the case. So what would God have you to do if you don't have that spiritual leader? God would have you be the spiritual leader. He'd have you be the spiritual leader. He'd have you to be the spiritual head of the home. Wherever there's a child, wherever there's a need uh, for for leadership, wherever the mantle of leadership must fall, that person must say, let it be fall on me, Lord. Isaiah said, hear my Lord, send me. We must personally accept the will of God. What do you know in your heart or you sense in your heart? Uh, that God would have you do. Do it. Whether it be walk the aisle to trust in Christ and be saved, whether it be uh, make a commitment of faithful service to the Lord, come what may, uh, God would have you uh, embrace the Bible and God would have you honor the Christian flag and, and that American. If you're an American, listen, let me tell you something. If you're an American, you are, uh, you, God expects you to embrace that flag. It represents everything, every blood, every drop of blood men and women have shed up through the ages. God to have you be a patriot. Now, I don't care much for unpatriot people. You done figured that out, haven't you? That's what God to have you do. Now go home and have a good barbecue and do some fireworks, amen, or something. But before we depart out of these... Uh, sacred uh, walls today. Let us personally accept the will of God for our lives. Let us stand.